invited to a bar mitzvah. Now, we had attended many bar mitzvahs, but not one that was part of a very conservative synagogue. So in the synagogue, the men were seated on the main, on the main floor, and the women were up in the balcony. So even when we got the invitation, my friends who invited us said, even though the invitation says 8.30, don't bother coming before 10.30. The service lasts for hours. And in Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew. No one, no one in my family speaks Hebrew. So thankfully, uh, we took the advice and showed up at 10.30. So I sat upstairs with my daughter. My son and husband sat downstairs. And there, was no, um, there were no microphones. So whatever we could hear was in Hebrew. So a lot of what happened upstairs was the women, we just chatted, kind of hung out. So at one point, about an hour into the service, a bag of candy, individually wrapped jellies, gets passed around. I have no, I'm thinking, wow, we get snacks because we're going to be here a couple more hours. So I grab one, and my neighbor, who's also not Jewish, turns to me and says, what do I do with this? And I said, oh, you just take one. I think it's a snack. Well, as the bag goes down the rows, I see women grabbing handfuls of candy, and I'm thinking, well, geez, how much are you going to eat? And I had all kinds of stories in my head that were kind of judgy about why these women would be taking gra handfuls of candy. Well, about 20 minutes later, when the young man of honor gets up, says what he says in Hebrew, reads from the Torah, all the women with the handfuls of candy throw it over the balcony onto the young man. This, the candy wasn't for us at all. It certainly wasn't for us to eat it. In that 20 minutes, I had just created a whole narrative that included judgment of everyone around me, that included that the candy was for me to eat, obviously. I told someone else to eat the candy. <laughs> when really all I needed to do was ask. Ask my friend, the mom of the young man, and say, hey, what's with the candy? Ask one of the women who took the handfuls, but I didn't. You bet that next time we got invited to a conservative bar mitzvah, I grabbed a handful and I was super proud of myself that I knew what to do. <laughs> How many parents or caregivers here text your child, no matter what age they are, whether they're in pre you know, uh, middle school, high school, college, and if you don't get a text back, you start creating the story in your head of what happened, right? Right? And then, this is what happens to me. I have an 18 and 21-year-old. So if I text them, and it's just a mundane text, and then I'm not getting a response, and I'm not getting a response. I have all kinds of narratives and stories, and I get afraid, and my tension rises, and I feel myself getting really, really tense until I finally get a response like, hey, mom. And of course, I have to respond back in shouty caps, where were you? <laughs> Only to get a response of, mom, I was taking a nap, or I was studying, or I was showering. Really mundane tasks that are perfectly reasonable. So I know, so finding out that my child really wasn't doing anything and wasn't in danger releases all the tension in my body, right? And I know that my physical responses to the stress that these narratives that I create in my head, you would think would teach me to refrain from creating these narratives because they don't serve me or my mental health. But of course, being a mom, I just keep doing it. So, um, but we do this all the time, don't we? We tell ourselves stories about how we think the world is. And oftentimes, we don't ask questions or confirm or clarify whether these stories or assumptions we're making are correct or true. In our personal lives, this can have humorous results, like the story of the candy jellies at the bar mitzvah. In our collective stories, and our collective narratives, the stories we tell can have much more problematic results. There's a phrase that I learned early in my social work training it's never too late to have a happy childhood. This refers to the idea that we could transform ourselves from challenging beginnings. I will add a caveat to that. Through my anti-racism work and working to unlearn internalized oppression, I know 
that transforming ourselves is fraught with limitations depending on our identities and socioeconomic status. For Unitarian Universalism, it is not too late to transform our faith to one that more fully lives into the values that we uphold, that we aspire to uphold. We hold narratives of our Unitarian Universalist faith and the history of the United States that are at best incomplete and at worst untrue. For example, many Unitarian Universalists revere and hold sacred the incomplete narrative of Henry David Thoreau. You know, somebody laughed already, I didn't even say anything. I say incomplete because he is widely viewed as a reclusive and creative writer who lived by himself in a cabin in the woods on Walden Pond. Well, that cabin he built was on his friend Ralph Waldo Emerson's land, and his sister and his mother routinely cleaned that cabin and baked him goods, even donuts. We need to remind and tell ourselves the complete version of Thoreau's interdependence. There's nothing wrong with the fact that Thoreau lived on his friend Emerson's land, or he accepted help from his family, or as a friend of mine also pointed out, he had a chair for visitors. So when people went fishing, they came and visited and hung out with him. Telling the full and true story we affirm our need for each other and for community, that we cannot, and in fact should not, go it alone. The idea of self-sufficiency is a fairy tale. That is one way that the fallacy of a meritocracy is upheld in the United States. The story of the meritocracy offered in the United States is one that upholds white supremacy culture and the notion that if you just work hard enough, you can pull yourselves up by the bootstraps. 11 months before his assassination, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was interviewed on television. You could YouTube this exchange that I'm about to share with you. A white male identified reporter said to him, asked him, quote, what is it about the Negro? Every other group that came as an immigrant somehow, not easily, but somehow got around. Is it just because they are black? Dr. King responded, quote, white America must see that no other ethnic group has been a slave on American soil. That is one thing that other immigrant groups haven't had to face. The other thing is that the color became a stigma. American society made the Negro's color a stigma. America freed the slaves in 1863 through the Emancipation Proclamation of Abraham Lincoln. But the slaves, but gave the slaves no land or nothing in reality to get started on. At the same time, America was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant there was a willingness to give the white peasants from Europe an economic base. And yet, it refused to give its black peasants from Africa who came here involuntarily in chains and had worked for free for 244 years any kind of economic base. And so emancipation for the Negro was really, he continues, freedom to hunger. It was freedom to the winds and the rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat or land to cultivate. And therefore, it was freedom and famine at the same time. And when white Americans tell the Negro to lift himself by his own bootstraps, they don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. Now, I believe we ought to do all we can to seek and lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps, but it's a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his bootstraps. 
and many Negroes by the thousands and millions have been left bootless as a result of all these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately made his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading, end quote. The issue of reparations for descendants of slavery and for Native Americans is one that remains controversial. I found a very recent March 2019 blog post on the, on the website Quartz titled, Americans are totally fine with reparations, just not for slavery, by Annalisa Morelli. The author lists a number of instances where reparations were given with little to no controversy. For example, in 1948, the United States Congress issued a reparation fund of $38 million for Japanese Americans interned in camps. In 1990, each survivor received approximately $20,000, and about 80,000 people claimed reparations for a total of $1.6 billion. In 1932, the U.S. government left 399 black men with syphilis untreated in order to study the development of the, of the disease. The study, called Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male, went on for 40 years. The victims filed a class action suit settling for $10 million worth of reparations for the survivors of the study, their widows, and their offspring. In 1995, a guarantee of free lifetime medical care for the victims, their children, and spouses was added to the reparations sum. In January 1923, the black town of Rosewood in Florida was destroyed in a racist massacre. After the lynching of an in innocent black man in response to an alleged rape attempt, a white mob attacked and destroyed Rosewood, burning homes and churches. In 1994, the state of Florida issued $2.1 million in compensation to be split amongst the survivors of the massacre. In 2015, the city of Chicago acknowledged that more than 100 black prisoners had been subject to torture by the police, which pushed some to confess crimes they hadn't committed the city awarded 57 survivors a payment in cash together with free college and social services. The total sum of $5.5 million was officially labeled as reparations. And Chicago, then Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel issued an official apology and mandated that torture be studied in public schools. Morelli writes, quote, in all of these cases, reparations were given out not just as financial compensation, but as a tangible recognition that a wrong had been done and that the United States or its states and cities held a debt toward a specific group. Opposition to reparations for slavery suggests that many Mer Americans are not ready to accept that there is a debt to be paid to descendants of those who endured the horrors of slavery and segregation under Jim Crow laws, end quote. After the workshop yesterday, someone pointed out to me that money's not gonna fix everything, and that's true. But the point of reparations is, again, facing the reality that the story this country has told about slavery and even about reparations is incomplete and distorted. Has anyone ever heard anyone say, well, I didn't own slaves as a reason not to work for reparations? I certainly have heard it. Statements like this one maintain the status quo of inaction and does nothing to inspire creating a different system that interrupts the continued harm perpetrated by the state on black and brown people. Another story that serves to maintain the status quo is we are a nation of immigrants. Anyone heard that one? We are a nation of settler colonizers. We are a nation of Native Americans who were slaughtered, displaced, and had their lands stolen. We are a nation of descendants of slaves who had free labor extracted from them for generations. If we told the complete 
and true story of the beginning of European dominance on this, con on this continent, it would not be up for debate that this country was built on the blood and tears of black and brown bodies. Reparations would be the least we could do. A few years ago, I attended a General Assembly and I was part of a workshop launching the book Centering, which is a book written by ministers and one, two religious educators of color and their experiences being leaders of color in a predominantly white space. During the workshop, one of the white ministers said, well, what do I do if my congregation is all white? My response to her was, all white or predominantly white space in the United States of America did not happen by accident. It happened by design, and white space is not neutral. Start with the history of where you are, where your congregation is. Find out how it ended up being all white. So I was grateful to hear Reverend Colin this morning give context to the history of this congregation. So that minister, whose name I did not remember, I just got an email from her about two weeks ago, the Reverend Karen Johnston, who is a minister in East Brunswick, and she said, Aisha, I remembered you said this, and I went back, and this was in 2017, and she, she said, I knew I would learn about the Lenape Indians, the, one of the original uh, Native Americans in New Jersey, but what I didn't realize I would know find out is that one of the judges after the state of New Jersey or, uh, made slavery illegal in I think 1818 uh, before the Emancipation Proclamation, one of the white judges had a son-in-law who was a plantation owner in the Deep South and in his courtroom he was selling slaves to his son-in-law. There is a street in New Jersey either around the congregation named after this man. And so this minister worked with the, the social justice group, the local NAACP. She partnered with folks to try to uh, change the name of that street. They weren't successful. However, what they will do is build a memorial in honor of the slaves and to let everyone know the true history of that place. It was a way to interrupt the narrative that, well, my congregation is all white, so really, where do we begin? How do we talk about racism? Not interrupting these harmful narrative only serves to continue the fairy, fairy tale of who is deserving in this country. We have only to read and watch videos of what is happening in our names on our southern border. This is a continuation of the distorted narrative of who belongs and who doesn't. I was not born here. I am also an immigrant from Egypt. Who is worthy and who is worth less and who gets to decide? Three children that we know of, and I have pictures of two of them, Jacqueline Ami Rosemary Cal Makin, seven years old from Guatemala, died in El Paso, Texas. This is her picture seven years old. Felipe Gomez Alonzo, eight years old from Guatemala, died in Alamogordo, New Mexico. And just this past week, we learned of an unaccompanied minor, Juan de Leon Guterres, 16 years old, also from Guatemala, died in Brownsville, Texas, all in the custody of the United States Border Patrol. These are the stories of lives cut short by our system that continues cruelty against people deemed unworthy. It is never too late to change the collective narrative of our stories. We do not have to endure the continued chipping away of our humanity. I carry these pictures of these, yeah, this was given out by Hope Border Institute. I was at a conference called Revolutionary Love and they gave these cards out and I put them in my purse and I carried them with me. We have it in us to prioritize and affirm the humanity of those with target identities. And I promise you, I know that some days it is so very daunting. I recently saw Stacey Abrams, who is my Shiro. She ran for governor and had an election stolen from her. She is a black woman. Uh, she recently spoke in Seattle and she only spoke for 20 minutes and for the rest of over an hour took questions from all of us. 
I know, right? And one of the things she said was, uh, there was a woman who got up and started crying and talking about sex trafficking and the effort she was trying to make, and she said, nobody cares. And Stacy looked at her and said, it's not that nobody cares. It's that people don't know what to do. It is overwhelming. People care. And Stacy actually had her sit next to her assistant because she actually named a bill she's trying to get through Washington State. Uh, the Seattle area has one of the worst sex trafficking um, networks in the, probably in the world, in the country. So Stacy said, I'm going to help you. I don't live in Washington State, but I'm going to help you because I know people. So while it seems daunting, and I know that there are days where I cannot even look at my Facebook feed, I cannot turn on the radio, I have not listened to NPR in over two years. I don't have a television, so I can at least avoid the local news. There are days that I just want to crawl under the covers and decide that, rea that in reality we're all doomed and there's really no point. And then I think about James Baldwin, who said in an interview, so this is also on YouTube, or you could watch the movie, I Am Not Your Negro, I highly recommend it, especially to white people. Quote, I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. To be a pessimist means you have agreed that human life is an academic matter, so I'm forced to be an optimist, end quote. I'm an optimist because I choose to believe that the more people become aware of the abject cruelty being perpetrated at the hands of the powerful, the more there is a recognition that we need to dismantle these cruel systems. I am an optimist because I love not only my children, but your children and our children, and really there's no such thing as other people's children, right? Thank you. <laughs> so let us begin to tell the true stories of our past so that our future stories can include a more equitable, just, kind, and loving world for all our children. Blessed be and amen. <laughs>